Thank you, Anna. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the Preparing RWJF Funded Data for Archiving and Sharing through HIMCA webinar. My name is Sarah Britt and I am the Data Project Manager for HIMCA. At this time, I'd like to have our project officer, Carolyn Miller, provide a brief introduction. Carolyn? Thank you, Sarah. Uh, on behalf of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I would like to welcome all of you to this webinar on preparing data for archiving and sharing through the Foundation's Health and Medical Care Archive, or HIMCA, as we call it. My name is Carolyn Miller. I'm a Senior Program Officer in the Research Evaluation and Learning Unit of the Foundation and the Program Officer for our grant with ICPSR. Next slide, please. For those of you who may not who may be new to the foundation we are the nation's largest philanthropy de dedicated solely to health we are working alongside others to build a national culture of health where everyone has a fair and just opportunity to live the healthiest life possible the foundation is organi organized around four broad areas of programmatic focus that you can see here on the slide we also have uh, research evaluation learning, communications, and policy units that support these four areas. In addition, the RAIL unit also works in cross-foundation areas in, of interest, such as our data sharing work. Next slide, please. As part of the Foundation's commitment to transparency, to the importance of access to evidence, and to the field of social science research, the Foundation provides public access to RWJF-supported research data that can be used for the purposes of secondary research by other research institutions and or individuals. This research data is included in our, uh, in our HIMCA uh, archive at the University of Michigan's ICPSR. RWJF grant funding supports ICPSR to expand and maintain HIMCA by collecting, curating, and preserving RWJF-funded research data, and importantly, providing free and open access to the data in HIMCA to foster new use and research with the data. We've been working with ICPSR since 1985, and the archive currently includes over 200 studies, and that number is growing every year. We're providing this webinar as a means of helping our grantees prepare for archiving their data and learn more about the HIMCA and ICPSR as valuable resources. I'd like to thank our wonderful team at ICPSR, Amy, Sarah, and Anna, for putting this webinar together. And now I'll turn it back to Sarah. Thank you, Carolyn. And a thank you to you as well, and Penny over at RWJF. So to give some additional background, HIMCA is housed at ICPSR. ICPSR was established in 1962 and today has over 14,000 studies. And last year, ICPSR won the National Medal for Museum and Library Services, which is a great honor in the archiving and library community. As part of ICPSR, HIMCA takes in archives and shares the RWJF funded data. The data meets certain requirements that we'll discuss later in this webinar. HIMCA also maintains a website where the data is shared for secondary analysis, and we provide support to users interested in using our data. Today's training is covering three broad topics related to data sharing, planning, preparing, and sharing itself. First, we'll discuss planning. So to start off, at the time of grant award, some RWJF-supported research are identified to produce a data set. These data are submitted by grantees for archiving and curating by HIMCA to preserve the data and make it publicly available for research by other institutions or individuals. The decision of what data are archived is made by the RWJF Program Officer on the grant in collaboration with the Research Evaluation and Learning Program Officer and the grantee. The data that are chosen are primary, qu primarily quantitative and national in scope, but other criteria may qualify the data for archiving. When data is shared, we, we expect to receive the raw data, any constructed variables that were used for analysis, and metadata. Metadata is the information and documentation that's needed to make data understandable and usable, especially in the future. 
there are many reasons to share data. At the top level, they include, include grant requirements, uh, responsible allocation of funds by funding agencies, and transparency and science. PIs, or primary investigators, also benefit from sharing data. Their citations and digital object identifiers, or DOIs, are ways to clearly demonstrate your impact in your field and lead to further grants. Data sharing benefits the scientific community at large also. It prevents resources from being repeatedly spent collecting the same information, and it allows for novel research concepts to be studied. It's often beneficial to archive your data or to start thinking about it before your grant ends. All data archived at HIMCA must eventually become available to interested parties. Usually this happens as soon as the process of depositing and archiving is completed, but the dissemination of data can be delayed in some circumstances. Embargoes typically last no longer than a year from the time HIMCA receives the study. During the embargo, HIMCA will process the data in the usual manner, but it won't be released to the public. When the embargo is lifted, the data would be ready for immediate dissemination. This helps if you're still in the process of doing your research, um, but you also want to make sure that you are archiving the data while everything is still fresh in your mind and while you're still on your grant. HIMCO will archive this preservation-only copy of the data for general safekeeping and learn how to work with it while the knowledgeable staff are still available and accessible. To minimize the time you spend working on data sharing, we suggest writing a data management plan that allows you to think through many aspects of data use and sharing. A data management plan allows researchers to determine what their plan is for preservation at the start of their research. It's not a requirement of RWJF, but it's recommended just to get you thinking about all of the different components that will be involved at the end. These data management plans often include specifying what data will be collected and in what format, descriptions of how the study will be documented, and indicating that HIMCA will be the repository. IRBs are often helpful in determining what data can be shared. IRBs often require that individuals participating in a study have been informed that the data will be shared in the future. This is part of the informed consent process, and your IRB can make sure that you're including the appropriate things. This is just an example of language that might be used in an informed consent to indicate data sharing in the future. ICPSR's website has several online resources available to assist with informed consent language and IRBs and data management plans in general. If you go to the ICPSR website, and there's a tab called data management plans that will discuss this and other information related to thinking through a data management plan. The next step in data sharing is actually preparing your data and documentation. A well-prepared data collection contains information intended to be complete and self-explanatory for future users. This allows less interpretation of questionable elements in the data or things that are unclear. This also allows you to go back to your research. Sometimes after you've worked on one study, you go on to another study, and then in 10 years from now, you might not know what a particular variable actually stood for if it wasn't well documented at the onset. When thinking about depositing data with PIMCO, we include three Ds, data, documentation, and descriptions, or metadata. Studies often consist of different questionnaires or populations being interviewed, and it could be multiple data files. So it's important to consider the structure of these. First, we'll talk about variable level structure. Variable structure can include naming conventions, the questions that correspond with certain variables, sometimes included in the label, and information on missing data, such as skip patterns, things that are not applicable, and true no responses. As long as it's well documented, variable naming conventions can be equally usable. There are some examples on this slide.
variable labels can help clarify any information not found in the name or not obvious, including information on raw versus constructed variables. To be valuable, value labels need to be mutually exclusive, exhaustive, and defined. This basically prevents you from having two variables that look like they're indicating the same thing. Missing data is most useful in the future when it's well-defined also. There are many types of missing data and they can be interpreted in different ways, depending on if it's a refuse to answer, a don't know, something that's inapplicable, or perhaps due to a skip pattern. Documentation is a study's best friend. User guides and questionnaires can often clarify confusion about variables in the data and allow for better curation. We accept documentation in many formats. Constructed variables are important to document and provide, especially for replication. If other data was added to your, to your particular data set that you collected, it's important to share if you're able, but if not, it's typically still, um, you're still allowed to share the constructed variables that used that data. Now let's go up a level from the actual variables and talk about the data files themselves. We accept a multitude of data file types, including the main statistical packages, ASCII and setups, and Excel files. Files can be organized in a variety of ways, depending on what makes sense for the study. There are different structures that may make sense, depending on if you had different time periods or different questionnaires. The final level we have to talk about in terms of structure is the study level. Basically, this is a descriptive summary of the entire research project, especially data collection efforts. Study level metadata includes the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the data collection. It really details out exactly what was collected and what this particular research um, goals and aims were. Thinking about the study as a whole also allows us to think about disclosure risk or the potential to re-identify individuals in the data. Direct identifiers are the variables that we consider obviously identifying, such as names or social security numbers, and we don't accept those for deposit and we will not ever share those. Indirect identifiers are less obvious, but may be combined uniquely to identify individuals. For example, someone might be the only person of their race in their zip code with their particular income level. We ask that researchers try to de-identify their data to make sure no direct, identifier, direct identifiers are archived. There are different regulations depending on what data you're collecting that might tell you specifically what needs to be removed. We ask that you remove all things that are considered PII or personally identifiable information and identifiable information such as names, social security numbers, or other direct identifiers completely. And we ask that you recode variables with those small unique counts into collapsed or top or bottom coded or masked somehow. Some data points may be difficult to de-identify such as video data, but you can share de-identified transcripts instead. And we also have different levels of restriction. Sometimes certain things such as small geography are useful for um, research in the future, but we cannot make them publicly available. So researchers have to agree to um, specific terms of use and the data is made available through a restricted data use agreement to make sure that they don't misuse the information provided. Although that we ask that PIs work on de-identification, HIMCA does do its own disclosure risk review to make sure that nothing has been overlooked. 
Now let's talk about the actual steps of sharing data with PIMCA. We have an online data deposit manager that all of our deposits go through. It's shared by ICPSR as a whole, so it's important when you are depositing with PIMCA to make sure that you select PIMCA from the drop-down menu that's provided. If you access the form directly through PIMCA's website, uh, PIMCA will already be selected by default. You have to create a My Data account, but it's just the way that you log in. And we have an entire page on our website called Deposit Data that helps you navigate depositing. This is a screenshot of what the main Deposit Manager workspace view looks like. So your deposit will be assigned a number, so you can go back and work on it if you need to. You can also share it. There's a right-hand menu that allows you to do different things with your deposit. The main deposit form helps elicit the metadata that we were talking about earlier, and it has the place for you to upload all your digital materials, as we saw on the last slide. We also ask for funding information, so having RWJF and your grant number are important for uh, noting it for future use. And this is when we need sort of your final version of all your data and documentation. It's also helpful for us if distinct studies are deposited separately. That doesn't mean that you can't have multiple data files, but distinct separate studies should be on their own forms. So here are some screenshots showing the sort of project description where you would list out principal investigators, summary, there's that funding field. We also ask for a scope of project, which are subject terms that you might think are related to your work. We'll expand on that as well. Geographic coverage, time periods, collection dates, the universe of who was surveyed, data types, and collection notes. Here you can see the methodology section and the related publications field. One of the great things about depositing with PIMCA is um, your publications and anybody who uses the data to publish, um, those resources all get to collect collected together into a bibliography, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Before you submit, you have to agree to a deposit terms these terms just basically state that you have permission to share this data and that the data are not identifiable to the best of your knowledge. As part of curation, we provide that DOI, the digital object identifier, and a citation. When secondary users download the data, they agree to a set of terms that require that they cite the data and send us anything they publish on the data. So there are also terms that guard the public data. And as I talked about earlier, when we determine that something needs to be restricted, there is a higher level of terms, a restricted data use agreement that not only does the investigator sign, but also their institution and their IRB reviews. As we talked about earlier, um, when mentioning the benefits of data sharing for the PI, we do, as part of ICPSR, collect usage statistics, such as the number of downloads and related publications. This can help. You can always go to your study homepage, um, which will you get notified of after curation is complete. And it will tell you these on the top right hand side of the page. And you can see how prolific or how often your study is being used. And that also includes the publications in the bibliography that I had mentioned earlier. As we wrap up this webinar today, the main takeaways are to think about data sharing from the start and to work with us at HIMCA at any step in the research process, the earlier the better to ensure easy archiving. Thank you for listening. Please visit our website for more information. And now I will take any questions. All right, great. Well, we had a couple of really good questions come in. <clears throat> Excuse me, the first question is, 
do I need to be an ICPSR member to get access to HEMCA data? Great question. So the answer is no. Um, HEMCA data, since it's funded by RWJF, and since HEMCA is funded by R RWJF, it is freely accessible. You just you need to log in to download the data, but you do not need to be an ICPSR member and there's no cost to accessing the data. Great, thank you. And a second question that has come in, does it cost money to deposit data to HEMCA? No, so as long as your data set has been selected by our WJF to be deposited with HEMCA, it does not cost any money to deposit. Um, oftentimes, this is worked in as part of your grant, the work that you do on the data archiving portion, um, but it, there's no fee involved. Great, thank you. Um, I see a couple of versions of those same questions, so thank you for answering those. Um, please do send in any additional questions via that questions module on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, the last question is um, just to ask for your email address. What is the HEMCA email address? Sure. So you can contact us at HEMCA, H-M-C-A, at icpsr.umich.edu. Perfect. Um, and again, you can contact that email address um, or please feel free to contact us at any time. Uh, you will be receiving the recording and the slides from this webinar via email, and you're welcome to send any additional questions at that time. Um, I want to send a resounding thank you to Sarah and Carolyn and everyone else who is part of the HEMCA team. This has been a great webinar. Um, and from all of us here at ICPSR, thank you so much um, for, for being here today. Um, Sarah, is there anything you wanted to say and wrap up? Just to visit our website and that we have a plethora of information there, please feel free to reach out and contact us. And if you are selected for archiving, we will be contacting you. Wonderful. And with that, uh, we will close this webinar. Thank you again to everyone for participating. Please send in any additional questions um, in response to that email that you will be receiving. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Have a great day.